Hello and welcome back to that haunted show. I hope you're doing great and had an amazing Halloween. But sadly, spooky season is officially over. But if you're listening to this and you're the kind of person I like, the one who realizes that spooky season never really ends, does it? Now, I love horror movies and probably have mentioned this countless times in this show. To me, they're not seasonal, right? I don't know about you, but I kind of watch them when I want to watch them, okay? I don't really have I don't really have like this hype because it's Halloween, you're meant to be spooky. I mean, I'm spooky all year round, and ever since doing this show, it seems that I'm apparently haunted all year round too. I am a weirdo, and I don't really get hyped about seasons. Like, if I'm feeling the Christmas song, and I actually like and enjoy the song, you know I'll be rocking out to it in the summer, man. I, I just don't care. Just be yourself. Don't do all this fake it till you make it bollocks. Be you, be true to you, and enjoy what you do, whatever it is that you do. Well, damn. We definitely got a bit deep there, something I was not planning, I swear. Guess I'm just vibing today with some positivity lately. Hopefully it sticks around. Maybe. Maybe I'll be a motivational speaker. Actually, nah. Screw that. We all found out my new true calling in life in that Mothman episode. If you listen, congratulations. You're amazing. I love you. If you you actually made it 10 episodes in, or I think it was 10 episodes in, I'm not 100% sure. But if that was your first episode, though, well, thanks for listening, I guess. I still love you a bit. (laughs) <laughs> nah, I'm just kidding, but I'm feeling good lately. The show itself is still being really fun for me. Making up new episodes, doing research, telling some ghostly stories. I'm really digging it. It's, yeah, I'm really happy with it and how everything's going. I kind of go through little phases, though. When you get obsessed with numbers for a bit, you look at the analytics and you're like, oh my, this didn't do good. Oh, like this Instagram post flopped and oh man, maybe they hate me. Maybe I've done something wrong. It's it's really annoying. I don't know why I do it. It's honestly, it's so frustrating because it kind of takes over. And it's something I'm definitely not proud of. I hate that kind of feeling because it makes me forget the reason that I started this show in the very first place. Now, I started that haunted show as mainly a hobby. As you well know, that the paranormal is something I'm definitely passionate about. I love it, man. I love learning new things about it, and that's the thing, it's constantly evolving. New things are coming out, and it's just an endless cycle, you'll never know it all. Then that's it, like, you do this, you do the show, you run the socials and all that, and making, you know, you know what, yeah, I'd call you all my friends, people who have reached out and spoken to me, I appreciate you, you know, and I definitely consider you all my friends, it's, it's great, we've had some great conversations with you lot out there, and yeah, I, I really enjoy that aspect of doing this show and meeting new people. It's something I really enjoy. Now, uh, from there, speaking to you about your own kind of experiences, especially difficult ones where you've actually opened up to me, it really hit a chord in me. I've always kind of been this crazy kind of nutcase who talks about weird things and experiences in all my life. But some of you have literally told me stories you've never told anyone else. Now, I really don't take that lightly, like, I really appreciate how you've told me these things, however difficult they are for you. Sometimes these thoughts and experiences sit there ruminating in your mind, and you can try and repress them all you like, but do they ever truly go? So, to actually open up and get that off your chest hopefully takes the weight off. I can't imagine having some of what you guys have actually experienced hanging over my shoulders, and having no one to actually talk about it with. So it really got me thinking, and that's when that haunted show kind of evolved in my head. It went from uh, being a hobby for me to creating a place to help people talk about these things. I'm by all means no expert, but I'm a good listener, and I've had plenty experiences myself. I could definitely lend an ear any time. I know how it feels. So if you need someone to talk to, I'm here. The socials are the same as always. That haunted show, all one word, pretty much everywhere. And of course, the email is thathauntedshow at gmail.com. I do this show because I love it. And the fact that I can help some of you, it, it really touches me, man. So thank you all again. Well, <laughs> damn, we definitely got deep there. I feel like I need an Oscar for this stuff. So uh, God, anyway, let's get on with it, shall we? I've been playing a lot of uh, Little Hope recently, which is uh on the playstation which uh is the dark pictures anthology which you may or may not know uh is the sequel well i say sequel next in the kind of anthology of uh man of Medan. and that game is really good and i i remember looking at this when it first came out it's actually uh based on a true story which i didn't really know i remember looking into that story so it'd be interesting to kind of cover that basically if you've played the game you know about the narrator in the story and he's a really interesting dude he's suave got a slick back hair a nice accent and all that and he's got like this library and he's got all the stories and he's really creepy but yeah I, 
just watching him, like, <laughs> I need him to narrate the show because it just sounds amazing. Like, his voice, I don't know who the voice actor is, I might look it up, but he's seriously really talented. And, yeah, it's just so suave, so... Yeah, I, I just love it. Like, the game is so good. Uh, I recently just finished it as well, so I'm now looking at playing Assassin's Creed Valhalla because that is finally out. I love the Assassin's Creed franchise, and I've been waiting for this game for so long. Like, ridiculously long, right? And it's finally out, which I never thought would actually happen. It seems to be dragging on forever. But it's finally here. I'm super excited, and hopefully it's pretty good. I'm going to download it tonight, so maybe I'll let you guys know. I did say I was going to get on with it, didn't I? So, anyway, my name's Lou, the creator of these creepy stories, and welcome back to That Haunted Show. So this story begins over in the States, buried deep in American history. Roughly around 200 years or so, give or take a few years. It's infamous in Tennessee. You'll be hard pressed to find a more prevalent paranormal story in mainstream history. Now, the story was so widespread at the time of its happening that it even caught the radar of the general and future president, Andrew Jackson. This story begins with a man named John Bell, born in 1750. The exact date is unknown. He was an American farmer, your typical family man of the time, working hard and providing for his family. So why is he important? Why do we do a story on just a random farmer? When in 1817, Mr. Bell contracted a mysterious affliction that worsened over the next three years, ultimately leading to his demise. But before we get to that, let's learn a bit more about John, shall we? Now, he was born in Edgecombe County, North Carolina. Bell was an apprentice barrel maker during his formative years, later pursuing a career in farming. He married his sweetheart and Miss Lucy Williams in 1782 and settled down together on the farm he had brought previously. The Bells did very well over the next few years, becoming infamous in the town for being the town's most successful planters. Over the consuming years, he and Lucy had six children in total. Jesse, Betsy, Richard, John Jr., Drury, and Benjamin. So it all seems pretty good, right? A nice, happy success story. Well, if it was, we wouldn't be doing an episode on it, would we? One day in the summer of 1817, John Bell was routinely inspecting his cornfields when he encountered something strange sitting in the middle of one of his corn rows. He paused and stared the creature up and down, almost shaking in fear. He tried not to move, focusing on keeping himself still and focusing his eyes on the creature that was in front of him. According to statements by Bell, the creature in his field had the body of a dog and the head of a rabbit. It was something he'd never seen before or heard of. The creature looked horrifying, and he felt fear he had not felt before from this creature's presence. He reached slowly for his rifle and shot the creature several times, or so he thought. The creature had vanished, and Bell tried to shake it off and rationalise the whole experience. It was early, maybe his eyes were playing tricks on him. He spent the rest of the day doing his duties around the farm, keeping an eye out for the creature, but never seeing it all day. It wasn't until that night he witnessed, well, heard something else. There was banging coming from the log house, banging so loud that it was echoing around the whole farmhouse. Mysterious sounds continued for some time, with increased force and frequency each night. Bell rounded up his eldest sons to run and charge the culprit outside, and always returned empty-handed. But this was just the beginning of the experiences in the Bell household. During the weeks that followed, the children began complaining of having their bed covers pulled from them and pillows thrown across the room by some seemingly invisible entity. As time went on, these experiences were getting worse and worse, and they were now beginning to hear faint whispering noises, which were weak to understand, but they always said it sounded like an old woman. The encounters escalated in severity again, especially for the Bell's youngest daughter, Betsy. She seemed to get it the worst now. She was experiencing these brutal encounters from this entity. Now this creature would pull at her hair, slap her relentlessly, leaving marks on her body and handprints over her face. During these encounters, John approached his family and made them vow to keep it a secret, as he feared they would be seen as social outcasts, being exiled from the town in which there were such prevalent figures. But it was getting too much for him to hold in, and John broke down one day, confiding in his closest and best friend and neighbour, James Johnston. Do you know what the story is? It's, of course, the Bellwinch Entity. Now, I really enjoyed this story. There was a lot of research to this story as well. I... It was definitely the longest research I've done for an episode and the most notes I've written. This could actually, this script could pretty much be 
an essay. <laughs> like, we did so much for it and it took me so long. And it's a bit more scary, a bit more serious. I'm gonna try and keep it more scripted and not go off topic. So hopefully it, hopefully it fills your little spooky needs. Now, Johnston obviously had his best friend's good intention at heart and decided that he and his wife would spend a night at the Bell household with them so they can experience it together and add credibility if they told the town about what's happening. So after setting up one of the children's rooms, bringing Betsy into their room, they all went to sleep for the night. Or well, they tried. All was well for a while until the covers were pulled from James and his wife's bed. After this, he was slapped repeatedly his wife seeing handprints and red marks appearing on his face with each hit he had received. Johnston tried to fight it off, jumping out of the bed, exclaiming in the name of the Lord, who are you and what do you want? There was of course no response, but suddenly the rest of the night became very peaceful and they all had the best sleep they had had in a long time. John believed that possibly speaking of the Lord's name helped rid them of the spirit, but of course they were wrong. The spirit came back, this time even stronger. Now its voice was even stronger, yelling out in their ears too, having intelligent conversations and even quoting sermons from churches that were said that very day. Now this was gaining quite some momentum around the settlement, even reaching as far as Nashville, where the Major General Andrew Jackson took a keen interest to the tale. A coincidence of such is that the Bell's eldest sons actually fought under General Jackson in the Battle of New Orleans, so Jackson decided to make a personal visit to the Bell Farm in 1819. He arrived with an entourage of soldiers and a wagon, the wagon itself suddenly stopping at the threshold of the property, and the horses spooked for their lives. After what seemed like hours of trying to calm and encourage the horses into the property, the general gave up, exclaiming to his troops, By eternal boys, this must be the Bell Witch. The general suddenly got light-headed and fell back against the wagon, holding his head. He had heard a woman's voice inside of his head. The woman had told him that they could proceed, but she would see them again later that evening. As soon as the voice was gone, Jackson was shook, but the wagon pulled away immediately. The horses no longer spooked. Bell and Jackson had a long conversation about what was happening, what happened and trying to summarise it all. One of his men stood up and claimed that he was a witch tamer. The evening was quite uneventful for some time, and out of boredom, the witch tamer pulled out a very clean and shiny revolver pistol. He opened up the gun's barrel, showing John the silver bullets encased within, stating, See this silver? This can kill any spirit that come in contact with it. He began to get cocky, claiming that the reason they weren't experiencing anything was due to the fact the witch knew he had the gun and was scared of it. Immediately after saying this, the man began screaming uncontrollable and his body began jerking in every direction possible, saying that he was being attacked and beaten from every angle. He finally dropped and received what looked like a kick, sending him straight out of the door. The entity finally spoke up, claiming for all to hear that there was in fact another fraud in Jackson's party, and that they would be identified and tortured tomorrow evening. Rightly so, Jackson's men were terrified and begged to leave the Bell Farm and to get the hell out of there. But Jackson insisted in staying so he could find out who this other fraud she spoke of is. Now what happened the next day was not documented by anyone, anywhere. But they were seen leaving town early the very next morning, stated as if they were charging somewhere. So it definitely looks like they had some kind of experience there. It looks like General Jackson and his men were getting the hell out of there. <laughs> so after witnessing all that, having one of your troops beaten and kicked out of the room, yeah, he probably hightailed it and got the hell out of there. I know I sure would. So these happenings became regular events at the Bell Farm, becoming part of the norm. Feeling helpless, they tried to get on with their life as much as they could. Betsy became interested in a young man who lived not too far away from her a man named Joshua Gardner. After courting for some time, they received the blessing from their parents to get married. Everyone was happy about the engagement and it was a nice distraction from the ongoing activity they were experiencing at home. The entity on the other hand was not happy. For reasons unknown, we can only speculate. My thoughts are that she would possibly leave and live with him, maybe getting out of the witch's grasp. The entity would screech in her ears and constantly tell her not to marry him. Soon after though, John had been experiencing these odd twitches in his face and having difficulty swallowing for almost a year now. Seemingly getting worse with time and by the fall of 1820 he was confined to the house which the entity tortured him re relentlessly, slapping him and pushing him over when he finally mustered up the strength to get out. 
Her voice could be heard all over the farm laughing and mocking old Jack Bell. Betsy and her beloved Joshua couldn't go anywhere without the entity taunted them. Ah, so it looks like the entity could follow them. So it makes no difference if uh, Betsy actually did marry and get out. So uh, aside from John, it really looks like she doesn't, he or she, whatever this entity is, really doesn't like uh, Betsy or especially her new mans. It finally got too much for Betsy that she called off the engagement on Easter Monday of 1821. These disturbances decreased since the breakup. Now the entity moved back to John, expressing how much she loathed him and vowed that she would kill him. John was still not doing well and passed away the morning of December 20th, 1820, after slipping into a coma the day before. Immediately after his death, the family found an odd vial of liquid in the cupboard that did not belong to any of them. John Bell Jr. gave some of it to their family cat, killing it instantly. Right, now, I've got to pause this because, as you all know, I finally got my little cat, little pumpkin. She's she, she's on the floor being a little nutcase right now. Pumpkin. No, she's playing. She She's shy. She doesn't want to be on the show. <laughs> but who does that? Who finds an odd vial and thinks, you know what? I've, I'll feed that to the cat. No, you're a sick fuck. And I hope you got what's coming to you. I've only had this cat a few weeks, but she is my new obsession. I feel like one of those typical cat parents now. <laughs> like... All this stuff just angers me. Well, actually, if you were doing that to any animal, it would anger me. Why would you give what you could only presume as an undisclosed liquid of some sort, which you all had no idea how it got there? Why would you feed that to anyone? Like, Jesus Christ. I don't know if it was just the time. I mean, it was the 1800s. Were people just thick back then? I presume so. The entity then exclaims that he gave Jack a good old dose of that last night, which fixed him up right and began laughing maniacally. John Jr. threw the vial into the fireplace where it burst into a bright bluish purple flame and shot straight out the chimney. John Bell's funeral was one of the largest held in Robertson County, Tennessee. After the service, as his friends and families began to leave, the entity was said to laugh loudly again for all to hear and began singing a shanty about a bottle of brandy. Now it said the singing didn't stop until John was truly alone as the last person had left the graveyard. Are you gonna say hello? There we go, we finally got a hello from Pomegan. <laughs> uh, the presence was now pretty much non-existent after John Bell's demise, as its purpose in life had now been fulfilled. But of course, that wasn't the end. In April of 1821, the entity visited the widow of Mr. Bell, Lucy. The entity had told her that she got what she wanted, but she will return in seven years. And that was all that was said. Not for what or anything like that. So this loomed over her head as time flew by as she thought of the worst. The entity returned in the year of 1828 as promised. This time, most of the visit was centered around John Bell Jr., with whom the entity had had long conversation with about the origin of life, civilizations, Christianity, and the need for a mass spiritual reawakening. They spoke and had this weird kind of deep conversation, but the strange thing is, uh, the entity itself had predicted these events of the Civil War. Now, like uncanny events that hadn't happened yet so they all believed that this entity was completely real it's kind of as these experiences happened they all had prior knowledge from the spirit right so the entity had stuck around for about three weeks to roughly a month promising that she was done with the family and she'll be watching over the bloodline of john bell she promised she'd make another appearance in 107 years to the most direct descendants in the bell bloodline in the year of 1935, she stuck to her word by visiting a direct descendant of Bell himself, a physician in Nashville, a Dr. Charles Bailey Bell. Now, Dr. Bell actually wrote a book called The Bell Witch, which was published in 1934. No follow-up was ever written, and he passed away in 1945. So the numbers are wrong. But for some reason, Dr. Bell decided that he would write up about his family's struggles with this witch. So were the stories passed down through generations, or did the witch really make her presence known and appear to Dr. Bell to tell him of her encounters with his bloodline? Looks like we'll never know, but I mean she had it pretty spot on with her promises and predictions so far, right? Do you reckon she actually appeared and told them of what happened? Is this what could have inspired him to create this book and share his, his family's struggles with this curse or affliction? 
who knows it's definitely interesting i it's hard to say whether of because of course we never know if it's something that's passed down was each kind of grandchild told scary stories about their direct descendants demise with this curse or some strange occurrences like that i mean strange stuff does happen and curses are a thing i mean a curse is only as strong as the person who's casting it sometimes there's not you don't we all, in effect we all cast curses every day curses are the way we say things and they're manifestations of our words right so i do believe that it's possible that they were cursed but it's definitely an interesting fact that he decided to write this book obviously the years are out of sync but he wrote the book regardless and got the story out there and i'm definitely gonna have to look up this book now the entity that tortured the bell family over 200 years ago is still being blamed today unexplainable events and manifestations still occur on the old bell farm is it still the bell witch is she still there is she looking after the property Rumour has it that the witch was actually a woman who was after the land before John cheated her out of it. Now this bit, I swear I'm not actually making up. I had the article earlier and I swear her name was Kate or something, but after googling it, like right now, I can't find anything on her. So this is a bit weird, like I remember reading this article. It was on my screen, I had it, someone called Kate cheated, uh, John cheated her out of the land and she promised that she was gonna make his life a living hell for as long as he had the property. I can't have made that up. I'm literally, I'm recording this just after I did the research and wrote this, wrote the, all the notes and the script for this show. And now I can't find it anywhere. So if any of you guys actually know, yeah, let me know because I swear this Kate or whatever her name was, she is the so-called bell witch. Oh man. That's going to annoy me. I don't actually know. And I can't find it literally anywhere. Typical. I'm just haunted, apparently. People today are still experiencing all sorts of activity at the property. From a lot of light orbs to human-like figures, breezes, whispers, and all similar experiences to when she was supposedly there. The cause of the Bell family's struggles was never known. It's still a mystery, and I don't think we'll ever know. Let's just hope it doesn't happen to your family. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Don't be scared. Or maybe you should. You never know. You could get a curse on you. Don't go pissing off any witches. <laughs> I was going to actually end it here, but I found an article last minute that could actually blow this case wide open. Now, this article is new, and by an apparent medium who has somehow tapped in and had visions of what truly happened back on that bell farm over 200 years ago. Sarah Delaney Pugh states that the bells were never actually cursed. In fact, the land in which they chose to settle was cursed, and it wasn't until they disturbed this land that this dormant curse was set in motion. Of course, intensifying. Which makes sense. Uh, it all started with the loud banging on the log cabin, right? And that's pretty much where it started after John saw that animal, if I remember correctly. Now this is where it gets weird. She said that the spirit had no right to take claim of John's death, and that the poisoning was actually done by someone else. The spirit was there, torturing the family and even the slaves he worked on the farm, but it did not kill John. A slave had killed John Bell. According to Sarah, this was because John had not been able to protect his then 11-year-old daughter Betsy from a family member in the house who was sexually abusing her at the time. Jeez. Uh, yeah, uh, maybe a little warning. This story, uh, I probably should have done this before, but no warning, this uh, story does actually feature some sexual abuse, so if you don't want to hear this, uh, probably skip ahead if I was you. I'm, I'm going to keep out details and not do a graphic or anything like that, but yeah, it makes sense why this curse or whatever was happening, the spell which entity was attacking John and Betsy so much, because it looks like it was mad at John for not being able to, to protect Betsy by some, but somehow, or Actually, no, the slave was mad at John for not protecting Betsy, so he killed her. Sarah had said that she had to give this girl a voice and bring it to the light, that it just can't be swept under the rug and she was being tormented sexually by this family member. The member was not stated. Bob Bell, the fifth grandson of John Bell and lifelong Robertson County resident, heard about Sarah's stories and agreed and stated that it makes sense. Now, this is a statement from Bob Bell himself. 
She blew me away. For someone who doesn't know anything about the history or hasn't studied it at all, she pretty much nailed it. Earlier this summer, Bell invited historian Tim Henson and Sarah to tour places linked to the Bell Witch legend and the Bell family farm. At each site, Sarah would scribble into her notebook and by the end of the day, she had listed the names of everyone in the Bell family and came up with facts both the men said was impossible for her to know and some they were not even aware of themselves. Here is another statement by Bob. I'm thoroughly convinced she has a gift that I don't have. She's the real deal. A lot of the family isn't going to like this because of the molestation part of it. But for me, the possession factor is central here. Uh, the family member's name was blurred here. Uh, so we'll just say so-and-so wouldn't have done what they had done to Betsy for no reason. It's a whole different story than the one I grew up with. But everything she wrote down had some fact to it. The story has as much right to be written as the original book. Whether it's true or not, who knows? So it seems that he definitely believes what Sarah was saying, right? She was coming up with facts and figures that both him and the historian could add credential to and all that and then coming up with facts they don't know. But of course, it's so long ago. Are we ever going to come up with proof or anything along those lines? It, it, it's a hard, long process, right? It's weird and this article was fairly new actually so I just thought I'd include it because it just seemed to appear. I seem to have lost the Bell Witch who she actually was but this article appears. And I'm really doubting myself and hoping I didn't actually make up who the Bell Witch was because I swear I read it and somehow it's just gone from my mind which is really triggering me. <laughs> but yes, we are done. That has been a bit of a long one and god damn. That was definitely the most research I've ever done on an episode before. Jesus. I know this probably isn't the longest length, but the script I actually wrote for this episode was long. It was around 5,000 words and it really did me in. I wrote it at night and I was absolutely knackered by the morning. <laughs> I hope you guys liked it at least. Now, I put that poll up on the Instagram whether you guys prefer the story-based ones or the research type stories like this one. They're both good in their own right and... It literally, I think you guys preferred story by, there was one vote in it. But I think I'll try and keep a good mix of it all. Because I really do enjoy taking a deep dive and researching all these things. Because you really do learn a lot. And like I said, I'm obsessed with the paranormal. And learning all these facts and all these incredible things that have happened over history. It really interests me. And hopefully interests you too. But here we go. We're at the end. Have a great day or night, wherever you are. I want to say a huge thank you to everyone who has listened to the show. We really are evolving into something great. And I just, I love it. I can't wait for each week. I can't wait for every episode and speaking to you all, it's amazing. So if you do want to get in contact, you know the socials. Uh, you can listen to us pretty much everywhere by now. If you go on my Instagram bio, click the link in there, it will open it up to every major platform. All the episodes are there. You can either listen on the website itself or it can link you directly to any platform. And also, as, as of lately, since we've changed distributor and we're getting a bit more momentum on each episode... It's, it's doing really well, and I'm really happy with everything, and we've upgraded the audio. Hopefully, this sounds really good. We've got a new interface, everything like that. We've got a new pop filter, a new microphone, and yeah, I've really invested in the show, and hopefully, you guys can notice the difference. I'm really dedicated to getting the ball rolling and really helping people out. Like You guys are the reason I do this show. I enjoy helping you out i enjoy talking to you all and doing the research is just an added bonus for me if you guys want to support the show a review on apple or wherever you listen i know apple especially because they're one of the largest uh, podcast platforms it really helps to target and find like-minded people so if you could write a review on whatever you think just make it honest like yeah we're probably not five stars the audio quality is, is lacking the Editing is not the best, but I'm, I'm learning as I go. And yeah, just be honest. I'd really appreciate it. And of course, if you want to donate to the show, feel free. It would be hugely appreciated, but of course, no obligations, as I do this all for fun and when I can. Now, if you wanted to donate, that you can either click the link in my bio or it take you to my website. And at the top right, there is a donation tab, or in the show notes, there is a donation tab at the bottom of every episode. Also, my sources for each episode are 
the bellwitch.org dot forward slash story dot html wikipedia forward slash wiki forward slash bell witch also tennessean.com with the website on the bell witch legend featuring sarah the medium so as always stay spooky stay safe and good night